Welcome to the Your Audio Solutions podcast, episode 13. Um, I'm just about to get ready to head up to Fringe, so I'm actually recording this podcast a week earlier than usual. Um, but it should be awesome getting up to Fringe. We're going to live in a great place. It's going to be awesome to show the people our show. And I'm very happy with the music and the sound design, actually, for the show. Um, so I'm excited to show it to people. Hope the feedback is going to be good. What else? Um, other than that, there's a few shows here in London. Um, getting ready to go on vacation after Fringe. Uh, but I need to get a shot, which should be fine. I'm not a, not a big fan of getting shots. <laughs> Um, so my girlfriend is making fun of me, but that's okay. Uh, I need to do it anyway. Um, today I'm excited to introduce you to my good friend, uh, who's an awesome producer, musician. He plays in a band called Indigo Face. Um, his name is Maxime. I'm going to try to pronounce his last name, which is, uh, Ragedia Obadia. Might have butchered that. Who knows? But his full name is Maxime. Ragedia <laughs> Ubadia. Sorry, Maxime, if I'm pronouncing that awful, awfully. Um, but this is a great interview, and I think you're going to love it. I met Maxime a few years ago, um, him playing in one of his own bands, forgot the name. But we started talking, hung out, and he invited me to the first studio I worked in called State of the Art Studios that was in Richmond, which is unfortunately closed today. But that was a great studio and he was kind enough to invite me to, to that place when he had a session with a band uh, we started hanging out went to see his band indigo face and some other projects he did and then we started working together uh, him as a producer me as his engineer and then we just continued to to work on projects we become really good friends and um, yeah, he's one of my, my good friends here in London. I'm, I'm grateful that I got to know him. He's been a great friend and producer and musician yeah, to know. So yeah, it's awesome to have him, have him on the podcast. And in this episode, we talk about him growing up in Paris. Because obviously from the name, you can tell he's French. We talked about him getting expelled from classical guitar school. we discovering the electric guitar. Him choosing between music and fashion. Because he actually studied fashion design for a few years we talked about his experience playing in front of a big crowd and the support he got from his fashion lecturer and how that was incurring how that encouraged him to pursue a career in music we talked about him moving to london and study studying guitar at bim um discovering discovering he had a perfect pitch his decision that he didn't want to be a shredder uh, on the guitar obviously uh, the, the importance of being able to tell a story through your instruments rather than playing fast and that playing less is actually more. Maxime's ability as a producer to take a song to the next level. What he looks for in a song as a producer when working with artists. The importance of being able to sing what you play and how that's important to us as engineers and anyone who's involved in music, to be honest. And some easy exercises you can you can do uh, to develop and learn how to sing what you play, basically. Um, the importance of patience, getting out of being stuck if you're writing songs and you feel like you're stuck. Um, how he met his fellow bandmates in Unico Face and their experience of playing in front of 60,000 people last year in Italy. And his experience of running and working in a band nowadays compared, you know, because... With all, all the stuff of getting onto Spotify playlists and just running a band in 2019 and all, all the different stuff you have to do compared to the old days. Uh, but I think you're going to love this interview. It was awesome having Maxime on, on the podcast and I think you gonna you can take a lot away and apply it to your own work and career. So um, yeah, I think you're going to love this interview, guys. So without further ado, here is Maxime. Welcome to the podcast. All right. <laughs> Just all right. <laughs> You're not excited. <laughs> <laughs> all right, move on. 
Actually, <laughs> for the listener, because I never done a podcast here, uh, maybe you can introduce the place. Where are we sitting? Where are we doing this podcast? We are sitting at my studio in East London. It's called Popham Studio. And uh, it was named after my nickname when I was a child. And uh, it's a small studio, you know, but uh, full of great equipment. And I think the perfect den for a producer and songwriter. Mm. Yeah, it is, man. I mean, because now you have a Neotech console, obviously, but it didn't start out that way, right? No, no, no. It started with uh, very little gear, recording-wise. Um, I needed... A big enough place for my guitars. I have a lot of guitars. I love. I don't collect them. I accumulate them. Um, and then, yes, I, I I felt like I needed to record in a console and mix with a console, mm. uh, or at least use the console as a summing um, mixer. And uh, yes, I got I got a Neotech a year ago now. And it's a fantastic console. It's doing everything I want. I get the warmth I want from an analog recording console and the nice width and depth from summing all the tracks in the console. Yeah. I guess I remember picking it up in Sweden. Yes. That was my god. That was a <laughs> that was a snowy day. That was a trip. Snowy day. Yes. No truck. Yes. <laughs> um so yeah, I bought it from uh, a studio that bought it from a radio station in Sweden, actually. So it's always nice to buy consoles from radio stations. That's what I heard recently, mm. because they're always uh, they're always looked after. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. There's always a technician that looks after them. Studio, it's different. A, a serious studio has a constant technician, but cheaper studios, not always. Mm -hmm. um, so this console was actually in very good condition. And uh, yeah, picking it up in Sweden was quite quite a stressful trip uh yeah. i think we got stuck in a snowstorm yeah, you exactly. know we can say that we <laughs> yeah. were um we were what like two three cities away from the place and when we uh -huh. arrived it was literally a snowstorm yeah and uh on the day the the, the owner of the console at the time said you can't pick up the console at yeah. this time it's just yeah, too yeah, crazy yeah. out there you yeah need exactly to, you need to go back to england and reschedule a trip to pick it up yeah so, yeah, emotionally, it was quite, um, quite hard, but I insisted, I, I, I knew this was the desk to have. So, um, eventually I got it and, uh, and it's now in the studio fully installed. Yeah, exactly. It sounds yeah. great, man. It sounds beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but before we get into all this fun stuff, maybe you can tell us where you grew up because you're not from England, obviously. <laughs> no, <Are> am I? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I was born and raised in Paris, France. Uh, I'm the only musician in the family. I mean, I'm the only professional musician in the family. Some some people play music, but mostly for fun and at Christmas parties and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I did not bathe in a musical background, per se. And um, my parents loved music, though. So um, I grew up quickly listening to the Beatles and a lot of classical music uh, in the flat. Um, Mozart was just bashing on the speakers on Sunday mornings. Mm. And then it was during the afternoon, the Beatles, Neil Young, Fats Domino had a big impact, actually. That's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Paris, that was in the 90s, I guess, obviously. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah in the 90s. How was it growing up, growing up in Paris in the 90s? Um, it was great. Yeah. You know, I had a very smooth childhood. Uh, my parents divorced at quite an early age when I was nine. Um, but hopefully in kind of a friendly atmosphere. Mm. So, um, so, Did yeah. Did you have a bad impact or? Um, I think I realized years later that, yes, I got some traumas from, right. <laughs> from my parents' divorce. But, um... Just because of the way I behave in, in relationships. Mm. Uh, but no, musically and creatively, I don't know. I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. I'm, I'm an only child and I feel today, uh, I'm about to turn 30, that I'm the same kind of individual that I was when I was eight years old. Mm. I have the same innocence. I have the same passion for things. The same, uh, 
I feel inspired the same way. I, I really feel like I'm a child in the body of a grown-up man. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, growing up in Paris, it, it's a beautiful city. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. It's full of history. And wherever you walk, uh, there's always something worth seeing. You know, whether it's a building or a, a street, a shop, a uh, an eccentric person here and there. Or it's just a city that is, for the eye and the mind, very stimulating. Yeah, exactly. Uh, London is creatively very stimulating. Paris is simply beautiful and poetic. Mm. And um, even as a child, I was very sensitive to that. Right. And um, But was it your mom or dad who got into music and playing? What was your first instrument? Was it guitar or piano? It was piano. Right. I started playing piano at a very early age when I was four. Um, we got very quickly a piano in the house, and uh, I just I just played it constantly. I was mm. I was drawing a lot and playing piano a lot. So right. at a very young age, my parents knew that I was meant to be a creative person. Let's right. say. Um, But I was really passionate about both things, drawing and um, and uh, and playing. Drawing led me to actually um, studying fashion design for three years after GCSE. So I kind of still believe that 18 that I would be a fashion designer, but music took over. It was yeah. just it was just my yeah. It's funny guts. that you got into the fashion design. Part. Yeah. So was it a hard choice between that and music, or just very? Yeah. Very. I mean, yes and no. I made it easy telling myself that I could do both. You know, right. yeah, of course, I can design a dress and play music at night. But <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's actually when I finished my degree, I was at uh, an internship in Cacharel, which is quite a famous French brand. And um, I really had fun there. And uh, I started talking about my passion for music to the people I was hanging out with there. And one of them told me, I remember her, she was called Emily. And Emily told me, Max, you're just constantly talking about guitars. Why, <laughs> why don't you just become a guitar player? Yeah. And I was like, oh, come on, that's impossible. I mean, I can't just play guitar. And she was like, I'm sure you know some people around you who make a living out of music. So why don't you just try? Hmm. And I came back home and I was like, yeah, I think, I think it's possible. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it a go, you mm -hmm. know. And... Um, And how far was that, was that into the fashion? I was program? on the third year of my degree in fashion. Right. And uh, I was very lucky to have um, a director in my fashion school who, was, who really understood um, my passion for music. He, he passed away now after a, a, a very fast cancer. Like in, in two weeks, he was gone. He, I was really touched by that. Mm. But he really contributed to um to my um to my career in music because i was in a very good fashion school in paris i started in belgium and then went went to paris for two years to finish my license and um the catwalks at the end of the at the, at the end of the year were in a big circus that is called le cirque d'hiver in paris right. which has 4000 seats and the school the fashion school was filling up all the seats at the end of the year and I I went I had an, I took an appointment with the director of the fashion school and I said listen I need to tell you something okay I'm um my parents are paying for this school for me to to become a fashion designer but I'm going to be honest with you I want to be a guitar player so at the end of this I'm going to do something else than fashion design and he said thank you for telling us and we're going to help you why don't you compose the music and perform it in front of 4000 people at the end of the year wow okay and I was like Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was amazing. So I finished my degree um, doing all my dresses and pants and all the stuff that I needed to do for the school and composing music. And the amazing thing was that at 18, I, I performed that music in front of 4,000 people playing massive guitar solos over, over chords that I composed. And it was just great. And the, all the pupils were... Um, were uh, walking with their creations and everything. It was it was gorgeous. That's awesome. And I did that yeah. two years in a row, actually. Wow. And uh, and then I arrived in London. And, yeah. Wow. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> so was it just you on stage or was it a band? No, no, no. It was a band. And um, what's really interesting and nice to uh, to see is that 
two of the people that were in that band that were really key members of that band, the drummer and the keyboardist, are two of the most successful musicians and producers now in France, mm. and uh, two of my best friends. Yeah. And uh, and they're going to be by my best men when I get married. Yeah. And uh, it was um, it was a very we were so young, we were so young, so naive when I look back on it. You know, this was. 11 years ago mm -hmm. and uh and we were just amazed by what was happening but these guys went on tour after that and played in they just filled up arenas you know with artists and we we still talk about this gig about uh being the the first big gig we've ever done together you know mm -hmm. and uh and it was just a student project you know yeah, yeah. but um but still it must have been amazing 4000 people Oh, you're yeah. young. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it must have felt like you're top of the world, I guess. <laughs> yes. And I remember the other musicians of the band being a bit nervous about the audience. I just loved it. Yeah. You know, when I opened the curtain and saw all these people sitting, I was like, no, no, guys, I'm not scared. I just want to do this, mm -hmm. you know. And this was a call that just told me, dude, you're, you're made to play guitar in front of people. Mm. You know, like whatever the number just do this i had a blast that yeah. night you know i wasn't nervous at all i was really relaxed and um i guess this gig thanks to this director cyril chardon of this fashion school was just um the first call for me you know to yeah. become a performer that's awesome man. yeah <laughs> that's cool yeah um okay so then you decided to come to london how was that why did you choose london why not america for example So um, there is a French guitar magazine that is called Guitar Part. And um, Guitar Part was doing uh, a sort of contest every year. Uh, well, it was a contest. And the winner of that contest was winning a year of scholarship at Tech Music School in London that is now known as BIM, BIM London. Mm. And I was reading this magazine in Paris. I was already passionate about guitars. Uh, already accumulating them and selling them and buying some other guitars and whatever. And I was reading about these pupils going to tech music schools and basically every month in the magazine, they needed to write one page about their experience at the school in London. So they were French in London, learning to become a session player or an artist, whatever. And they were talking about their experience in London. And I was just eating that page basically i was like oh my god that that person seems to have so much fun in london i need to be there i need to go there so it is thanks to that magazine that i heard about tech music school i heard about the possibility to be a pop guitar student basically and uh i uh, i had a big talk with my parents Um, it was a very emotional dinner. I remember uh, calling them separately and said, Mom, I think you, we need to meet with Dad tonight and vice versa. And we, we met in a restaurant in Paris and I just burst in tears and I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm so sorry I asked you to pay for my fashion school, but right. here's the thing. I want to play guitar now. That's my thing. Trust me, I want to be a musician. Mm. And, uh, and they were so relaxed and they said, why are you crying? Of course, just do it. And I, f I felt so lucky to have parents that were that open-minded and yeah. allowed me to just follow my dream, whatever it was. Yeah. And they said, okay, just finish your diploma in fashion so you have it in the pocket and go to London and have fun, you know? Mm -hmm. So the year after, September, I was already in London studying at uh, Guitar X, which was the Department of Tech Music School. Right. And I had the best years of my life. Yeah. For four years, it was just amazing. I can imagine. But how... So first of all... What sort of music did you, you know, what, or what kind of music was your thing when you started playing guitar? Like who got your, who made you obsessed with the guitar, basically? Before going to school, right? Mm -hmm. um, my first, my first um, guitaristic emotion, if I may uh -huh. call it so, is Ry Cooder. Right. Really? Uh, I mean, no, that's, that's not even true. That's not true. I okay. Let's start again. Sure. I I learned. I started learning guitar at the conservatoire, at the classic school in Paris, mm -hmm. when I was nine, and I was learning flamenco guitar, classical guitar. Wow. And uh, I remember 
liking the guitar, but not liking what I was learning. It was just a bit too academic. And um, I remember my teacher was, she was very nice. She was a very sweet woman, but she was just very classical based, you know. And I remember because I, I had perfect, I have perfect pitch, but at the time I discovered that I had perfect pitch, so I could play any song on the guitar. And I was so proud of that. How, how was that experience? How did you... Well, how was that moment you experienced like, damn, I can, I can play what I hear, essentially? Uh -huh. um, well, it didn't start like that. I could, I could simply name what I could hear. So when people, it was at the classic school and we were doing an, uh, note di uh, dictations. And uh, so basically the teacher was playing calls and notes on the piano and pupils had to guess what it was. And I was just having 100% uh, everywhere, you know, and uh, my teacher told me, oh, well, you have perfect pitch. And I I almost thought it was bad, you know, so what is that? What, what do you mean? You know, because it's not called perfect in uh, in French. It's called oreille absolue. And absolute can mean sometimes a bit too much, you know, so having the oreille absolue yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. whoa, is that too much of something or am I normal? That's or interesting. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, then I just understood that I was basically hearing and rec recognizing all the notes and all the sounds I could hear and, and uh, put them under music if I was able to play an instrument. Of course, I needed yeah. technique. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, yes, when, when I went back to playing piano and guitar, I could learn faster. And actually, I'm not a very, a very good reader nowadays just because I don't need to read music much. I just need to hear it once or twice mm. and just reproduce it. Um, but yeah, to, to go back to classical guitar, I arrived in the room one day and I said, listen to this. And I slapped on the guitar, Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, on a classic guitar, you know. Ba, 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 da, da. And my teacher was like, you need to stop that. Your sound is awful. You can't play that kind of music on a guitar like that, you know. Right. And she started telling me about electric guitar. She said, this is music people play on electric guitars. And I was like, electric guitars? Yeah. So c can we study electric guitar here? And she said, no, 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 no. That's right. not what we study here. Right. Here it's you know, classical guitar made of normal woods with a hole, no pickups. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's boring. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got fired of the of the school the director during my exam said you have an awful sound with that classical guitar right. you, you'd better stop to be honest that's what <laughs> he right. told me and um i stopped and uh, for five years i did not touch a guitar wow. you know i was just traumatized for me yeah. for me guitar was the end of freedom you mm. know and then um my stepbrother one day when i was 15 played played me Thunderstruck by ACDC. Right. And when I heard that intro, I was like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. What is that instrument playing this crazy thing? You know, the energy, everything. And then when the drum comes in, but still that guitar part goes on. And then I was like, okay, if that's a guitar, then I need to play that. I need to go back to this or to simply go to this, you know, because it was a brand new territory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the week after, I already had three albums of ACDC, I ate them all. And um, for my next birthday, when I turned 16, I asked for an electric guitar. So I got a Mexican Fender. And the first thing I learned with that was I Way to Hell. Right. And then, and then Thunderstruck and all the songs. And that was the beginning of love for the electric guitar. So I have to say that, yeah, that, that my first emotion that got me into, play, into playing electric guitar is ACDC. And then what made me want to become a musician is Ry Cooder. Mm. Yeah. In, I, in, in which way did he inspire you to be a musician rather than just, yeah, guitar player, so to speak? So that summer when it was my birthday, when I turned 16, I was in the United States with my dad. It was a trip that we did the both, uh, uh, the both of us. And uh, the two of us, sorry. Um, and, um, we were basically camping in Montana, Wyoming, and then California. And then we rent a car and we went from Monterey to Los Angeles. It was a beautiful trip, just the two of us, gorgeous. Nice. And I, I was really into electric guitar during that summer. And we were going in these towns where there were so many pawn shops and even that city called Bozeman in Montana where, where they make uh, Gibson acoustic guitars. Right. And I remember seeing all these fancy guitars and I was... I was like, Dad, I saw one, one of these. 
And he, and he was like, you know, an electric, a good electric guitar is expensive, so you better buy a cheaper electric guitar first, see if you like it, and then maybe you're going to get a nice amplifier and a better guitar and everything. I was like, oh, come on, that's boring. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I got, I got a basic guitar and a shitty amplifier. You know, we all started like that. Um, but during that summer, I asked, I asked him, who are the guitar players to listen to? And he said to me, well, there is Ry Cooder. John McLaughlin and Santana. I was like, okay, I'm going to check them out. And I really checked out Ry Cooder, like hardly. And I just remembered when I started checking out Ry Cooder that he was the producer and the musician, one of the musicians behind the Buena Vista Social Club project, uh, which was this beautiful movie made by Wim Wenders in the 90s, 1996, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it's about this, uh, musicians in Cuba um, af after the, the, the um, how do you say in English? What they call war? Uh, after the Cold War, yeah, after the, the presidency of uh, Fidel Castro has right. started and everything, that basically stopped playing music for years and years. And Wim Wenders and Ray Kuder go to Cuba to find these musicians who are almost 80, every one of them, put them back together. And create this wonderful album uh, recorded at Agram Studios in Cuba and then start a wonderful um, world tour with these musicians. And the album got a Grammy. It's a wonderful album to listen to. There's many albums that were recorded and produced by Ry Cooder after that. And um, so basically when I started listening to these blues and rock albums by Ry Cooder, I just remember that, hey, he was the man behind that. So I also checked Cuban music and then world music, although I don't like the term of world music, but I really got into uh, the input that some British and American people had into African music and Cuban music mm -hmm. and Caribbean music. And it was, it was a very interesting journey. Right. So why do you think your dad suggested Ry Cooder as a guitarist for you to listen to? Um, because he got fascinated by this documentary, the Buena Vista Social Club. Um, we saw it, we saw it together actually, and um, he went to Cuba the year after the documentary was released. Uh, I was too small at the time to travel with him uh, because I was nine, but I remember that he. He came back with all these memories and postcards and feedback about Cuba, the old cars, the music, the colors, the smells, the food. And um, so he remembers this documentary very well, what it evoked him at the time. And uh, yeah, the first time that popped in his mind is Ry Cooder, which is actually a very quirky example of a guitar player to listen to. You know, probably in the 90s, if I had asked, a normal cool kid, he would have said, well, man, you need to check for Shante and Slash, you know, right. and Dan Back Barrel and Daryl, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. all these guys. <laughs> but um, yeah, it didn't go like that. It was no, Ry no. Cooder. That's cool, man. And I just listened to him and I just got into it. It was that slide thing that, like, that's the thing. Like, the second guitar player I checked out after Angus Young was just a guitar player that was playing like a voice, you know, and, and Ry Cooder is, is still nowadays my, my spiritual father. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you actually lent me that DVD. I'm going to check it out tomorrow. Yeah. It's my plan. <laughs> yeah, because it sounds really, really cool. Which DVD is it? Oh, the win of his Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man. I'm going to check it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, that's my promise. <laughs> um, okay, so you, you went to London to study at BIM yeah. or tech, whatever it was. Yes. Same thing. Yeah. Um, what was the experience studying here in London? Was it really different to Paris, like to live here? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it's just, there's one little sea that separates us, you know, one tunnel for the Eurostar, but the, the culture is so different. The energy, music, everything it's already it's it's even much more expensive you know it's it's everything is different so um although i knew london a bit because i i spent some uh, some time there before moving there to study music um discovering it as the city of music was a brand new thing for me there's music everywhere mm. 
in every pub. There's so many venues, there's so many superstars playing every day in London at the same time, you know? So um, this doesn't happen in Paris. No. Paris is much more conservative, old-fashioned. You know, there's great music in Paris. Paris is a, is a temple for jazz, for example. Um, pop music is, is quite good, but London is just another level, I have mm. to say. And um, it's just full of musicians as well. And what really struck me at the time was that musicians here are a family. In Paris, they are only competitors. Don't get me wrong, we are in competition here, you want it or not, but we also help each other out. You know, when you can't do a gig, you give it to someone else and vice versa. And uh, we also give each other advices, you know, how can you get that piece of gear cheaper? Call my friend or you need to mix your record. Well, go to this guy or that girl, you know, there's we're all helping out each other. And uh, you feel like you're not left out when you're doing music professionally in London. In Paris, it's it's another story. Mm. You know, people are more um, they're very protective and uh, they don't want to share what belongs to them. It's too precious. London is all about sharing. You know, what's mine can be yours. What can you show me? I'll show you some of my tricks. What is your trick? Mm. You know, and that really blew my mind. And yeah. that made me want to stay even more, you know. Yeah. Um, just because we, we were learning stuff, of course, as pupils at the school. But when, once school was off, we were jamming all together. And it was just... Um, it's just these wonderful memories of gathering with people yeah, and sharing musical information, emotions, everything. Very human. Mm. But so if someone is thinking about studying guitar, would you recommend them to do it? Yes. Yes. It's, you need to listen to yourself. If you, if you think you're not good enough, study. If you think you're good enough to do this or that, give it a try. And if you were not good enough well go back to study or, or start studying guitar mm. you know um when i arrived in london i was already paid as a musician so i can't say i arrived as a professional musician but i was already doing a few gigs and being paid for it mm. but i knew i needed to learn tons of things you know funk guitar reggae rock i needed to learn blues again how to play proper chords again how to learn soloing you know um but yeah, I, I just felt like I needed vocabulary to speak better. Right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's cool, man, because yeah, studying is not for everyone, but yeah, it can definitely help some some people, I guess. Yes. You need to yeah. want it. Yeah. That's what we saw at school. It was interesting because it was a private school. So people were either paying for it or their families were paying for it or they were borrowing the money for mm. it. And we, I saw so many people at school making tremendous efforts to afford the, the amount of money for school. And still, they were bored at school. They were not learning stuff. They were not showing up at live performance workshops. They, they were not doing it properly. Right. And that really made me think. I was like, no, no, that, that doesn't work. Like, If you want to study, you need to want it. You need to want to work hard. You know, I work hard nowadays as a session musician and producer, but I almost think... I worked harder during my, my scholarship. Mm, right. It was just constant, constant, constant playing. Yeah. You know, I was married to music, married to my guitar, you know, sleeping with it almost. Like it was constant, constant learning and applying of yeah. guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I mean, do you have a thing that was like, or what was the hardest thing for you to learn in school as a guitarist? Was it something that this is... This is going to take some practice, either technical or just theory, if that's, uh, if that's rightly put. I decided at an early stage of playing guitar and learning guitar that I didn't want to play fast. Mm. I'm not interested in playing fast. I'm not a shredder. Uh, I admire them. I'm a huge fan of Satriani and Steve Vai especially Steve Vai and some of these, some of his latest albums are just wonderful. I can't play a single note of these albums and I just admire it, but I don't need to do it. Just because what I want to say in my story as a musician doesn't have to use that vocabulary. I can't, I can 
speak and tell what I have to tell without shredding. So when I arrived at school, it was actually quite hard because I remember fighting with a few teachers, telling them, I respect what you're teaching me, but I'm afraid I'm not going to apply it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn it. Okay, I'm going to learn the scale and do the tapping shit and everything, but I'm not... Don't expect me to have a good mark at my exam because I'm simply gonna I'm gonna focus my time on other things I want to do with my guitar. Mm. And uh, it's funny because these teachers I told that to are still in touch with me nowadays, and we're still friends, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite happy to have managed that to have faced them, but still they saw that I was not disrespecting them. They saw that I was stubborn enough to know what I needed to learn. You know, right. so. Don't get me wrong, I learned tons of things I didn't know before showing up at school, but uh, I didn't want to play fast. No. And when the, the, the exams on the third year were, were about shredding, basically, I just had the worst mark ever. What was it? You that's, know? that's funny. I still had a first at my diploma, uh -huh. but I didn't, I didn't nail the shredding part. You right, know? yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's funny because you say that because me as a guitar player, I'm... Um, I was all about learning technique. And I think since meeting you, you told me about, or someday you told me about, uh, you know, thinking about the chord. I don't know, it was something to think about the chord that's being played. And you said something about playing, playing the notes for the chord, maybe the third, whatever. I don't know what, really what it was, but it started chord to me as in be able to tell a story when you play guitar. Mm -hmm. Is much better than just having technique, basically. Yeah. And that's why I think me looking at you is something you have, you know. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, that's, that's, that's a great skill to have as guitarists, I think. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that earlier, but um, electric guitar, I mean, guitar. Guitar is, is a, a department where the less is more proverb really applies. You mm -hmm. know, because um, if you have the right tools, doing not a lot on your guitar can be tremendously good. With an acoustic guitar, you kind of need to be busy because the notes don't have so much sustain. And that's why I play electric guitar a bit more because there's, we can have more tools, you know, and more fun with our little pedals and stuff like that to make one note sound like a symphony, you know. But I really admire guitar players like Ry Kuder again, or The Edge. I think The Edge is one of the best guitar players in the world, you know? Technically, he's not mind-blowing, but still, being that tight on guitar parts with these wonderful delay pedals everywhere and mm. creating these ethereal sounds that we all remember that created the sound of one of the biggest pop bands of the world is, is something technically immense, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just... Yeah, one, two, three notes maximum can be massive. Yeah. You know, or guitarists like Lenny Kravitz, for example, who who plays chord successions with power chords or single notes, like always on the run is a beautiful riff, you know? And it's it's just not so much. It's just rhythmically really there, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, guitarists like that really inspire me. Even Prince, when he was just comping... On, on funky things. He was not doing tons of things. He was no. just super tight with the right tone at the right time. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this gives me more emotion than fast things, you know? And then fast guitar players like Steve Vai need to compose fast things, you know? And I respect that. It's just that, that that's the thing. Steve Vai composes tracks that are suiting his playing yeah, yeah therefore they really suit him they're tailor-made for his style yeah you know um but yeah it's it's a taste thing yeah exactly i mean it's funny that steve Vai play with frank zappa because i don't see yeah. his style having uh, would have worked with steve uh, sorry with frank zappa really i don't know how how he shifted from frank zappa to his <laughs> current style because i don't believe he played the same stuff obviously no well, Frank Zappa was calling Steve Vai my acrobat. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, and okay. he was uh, introducing him on stage like that. Like, ah. here's my acrobat. Do your thing. And that's when Steve Vai really started owning the stage for himself and doing his shreddy thing. Oh, was it? Yeah. Ah, right. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, Eddie Van Halen was was doing the same thing. You know. Yeah, so yeah. these were the very first fast guitar heroes. Mm. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, and that's the thing is Steve Vai has a knowledge of jazz that is immense you know yeah. he knows harmony until until the very end of it you know yeah yeah exactly and uh still his biggest hits are not so geeky you know it's quite lately actually in his albums that he went back to very thick chords and a lot of harmony and weird things and like things that are very zapesque sounding mm -hmm. but for for a very long period like um uh, passion and warfare and and all these other albums are very rocky and shreddy and and not so complex uh in the in the cold structure but now now he's really nailing it again right. yeah yeah hey it's cool man <laughs> uh so let's talk about you as a producer because obviously i've worked with you as a engineer mm -hmm. and you have produced me as an artist <laughs> so you have produced me basically yeah um and you know i think we mentioned this before but I always been amazed how you can listen to a song, either it's mine or someone else's, doesn't really matter. But how you can listen to a song, think about something, and add the perfect part, either it's a bass line, synth, whatever, guitar thing. So I was wondering, what do you listen to when you hear a song? If I play a song, what do you listen to? What, what's, what's going on inside our brain? When I listen to a song, the first thing I look for is emotion. If the song is not make, making me feel like anything, I, I just want to stop listening to it, you mm. know, or politely, I'm going to go <laughs> to the end of it and, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. But I look for emotion. Emotion can be so many things. It can be the lyrics, it can be the melody, it can be the instrumentation, that simple guitar line there, that keyboard sound, you know, anything. But that's what I need. So... The thing that I will want to change, create, or tweak as a producer is the emotion missing or the emotion that is already there, but that we could push further, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I listen to... I focus on what I don't like when I listen to a song, you know? Mm. If I like something, well, it's already digested. Okay, I'm accepting this. It's already making me groove or feel like this or that. I... What I will focus on is what I don't like and very quickly interrogate myself. Why don't I like that? Is it too weird for me? Is it not tight? Is it not in tune? Is it not accurate for the song? Should, should we use another instrument, another type of vocabulary, another voicing? Um, and quite quickly in my mind, and, and also thanks to Perfect Pitch, I try to re-sing that part or to hear it differently. And then... I can quickly recommend the artist to, to, to either change this or that, mm -hmm. you know, after listening to the song. Yeah, oh, because you mentioned uh, singing, sing, sing the part in your head, yes, I guess. Yes, yes. Because that was something I've seen in players like yourself and other players, the people who can sing always seems to have an edge on people who doesn't sing, like myself. <laughs> you know, there's some extra, there's something... Uh, I don't know how to explain it, explain it, but like something extra tasty in your approach to either how you um, compose guitar lines or stuff you think about when hearing a song. You being able to sing puts you on an edge, you know, compared to other people like myself. Uh, um, I think... I think you... Sh I don't know. I could sound cocky saying this, but if you want to be a good musician, if you want to be hired for what you do, you should be able to sing what you create. You know, your hands are something. Your voice is another, but you need to link both mm -hmm. because what, what is making your voice sing is your brain. You know, your brain is triggering notes and your voice is simply making them happen like when you speak you know and i think that you should be able to translate what you have in mind with your hands with your voice 
even if you're not so much in tune, you know, fuck that. You don't have to have the same vibrato with your voice that you're going to have with your guitar, but you should sing that part because that's, that's the genius of Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson composed most of his hits not playing a single note on the piano. He was um, simply singing it to Quincy Jones and the other producers he worked with. You know, and then for for the guitar, and then can it go into this kind of hold line? And like it was working like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Charles Chaplin composed the music of his movies only dadaing the the the, the melody. You know, ah, know, smile, which is a jazz standard nowadays, was composed like that. And the guys were like, okay, 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 okay. Just like <laughs> charting out everything. Yeah. But that's the thing. The voice, I think, is the very first instrument and it has to be the first instrument of everyone. Even if you're a percussionist or a drummer, you should be able to sing your groove, imitate your groove, you know, to, to kind of translate it and and then, of course, apply it with your hands or feet or whatever you have. But, um, but yes, singing, singing or translating with your voice the parts you have in mind, I think, is important. Yeah. And do you know any good, like, techniques, not techniques, but practices someone can do to learn how to sing if they're just starting out? Yes, of course. Um, start playing scales on your guitar, piano, whatever the instrument you're doing, and sing that scale when you're playing it, while you're playing it. Mm. Sing along to it. Up and down, and then go a semitone up, and then a semitone up, okay? And stop where your voice is breaking, or when your voice is breaking, go an octave lower on of that note, you know? And basically, learn to... Spend time with your instrument, have an appointment with your instrument, simply singing with it. Mm. And then start jumping notes in that scale. Play less notes of that scale. Play intervals, okay? And play a third and a fifth and then a major seventh and try to sing them and then invert that. And then the other thing is to do a lot of transcribing. So, for example, you listen to that solo you like or that single line you like or listen to saxophone players, trumpet players. That's an amazing way to learn guitar soloing. And that's cool. sing the solo first, you know. Okay, so it's doing that. Then find your way on the guitar. And when you find your notes on the guitar, sing along to them again, you know. And the one who masters that is George Benson. George Benson is known to solo while singing, you know. Right. And that's just because he spent so much time with, with his guitar, probably learning all these saxophone players, these Coltrane solos, you know. And... Um, and yeah, I think that's the way to take it like progressively, start from the scale and then jumping notes, intervals, and then themes, you know, uh, the shadows, for example. That's a wonderful way to start singing with your guitar, you know, because right. they're very simple themes generally. And uh, you can sing them and sing them while you find your way on the guitar, you know, yeah. and then yeah, that's cool, man. get better at it yeah, little yeah, by yeah. little, you know. Yeah, because as engineers, it's also important to be able to do it because communication mm. if you're in a studio you want to be able to talk to people like hey this line or you can sing it to them yes would help yes you know tremendously rather than be like <laughs> oh let me just find it here and press play and show it to you yeah right exactly yeah so that's the thing it's not about to be it's not about being a perfect singer no it's just about being able to translate with what you're hearing or what you want to do. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be pitch perfect. But I think you should... I think it's important to train your voice to depict the ideas you have in mind first and then apply them with yeah. something else. Yeah, exactly, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool, man. I I need to do some more practice in that <laughs> area. But it's fun. It is fun. It's... You need to have fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's the main thing, I guess. You know, that's <laughs> the thing. Um, uh that's what I that's what I tell to, to, to the people I either teach guitar to or hang out with in the studio or play gigs with. Um, practicing has to be fun. Otherwise, mm. there's no point. Or if it's a big effort and you're actually having a hard time, enjoy the fact that in the next 15 minutes, you're going to be better than you are now. Yeah, exactly. You know, you look back and you're like, wait a minute. 
this is good, you know. Yeah. Like I couldn't play that 15 minutes ago, and I, I can. Exactly. And and in 45 minutes, I'm going to play that even faster and better, you know. Yeah. So um, so that's what you should enjoy. If if the effort becomes hard and 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 not very enjoyable, enjoy the journey. You mm -hmm. know. Well, take a rest, put your guitar down. You know, do something else. Go back to it and enjoy the journey. Yeah. And look back and and appreciate the fact that you're better. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, something that comes into play is patience, obviously. And that's something that's been in my mind a lot lately, patience in just anything we do. I think you and I have talked about it in the yes. past. Because I don't know if we're expecting everything to happen at once. I, I don't know if that's a thing. Maybe it is. Um, but yes. you got to give yourself patience with this because maybe, if, maybe an hour into practicing, you might be... You know, oh, fuck this, I'm not progressing fast enough. Asking, because we can watch all these YouTube videos and the guy can explain how to make a million dollars in 15 minutes, but mm -hmm. it might take you 10 years to do that, you know. Exactly. So I think patience is not really talked about patience. enough. Patience is the goddess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, especially nowadays. We are in this era where... Computers are so fast. Information is so fast. Even digital audio workstations do musical things like quantizing so fast, tuning so fast. Like, but that's that will never change the fact that in order to build something good, you may require patience. Sometimes an amazing song comes in the next five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't expect it, and it's just coming. Embrace it. But for most of the things in the musical process, especially in producing and recording, you need patience. If you're not able to, whoa, then you do a hard training and become a ninja of patience because you are going to need it. Yeah, exactly. You know, the work in the studio is, is long and you need to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to prepare it. You need to probably tune your gear for, for the studio session. You need to choose the right mics, the cables, you need to cable everything. And then if you work in a desk, you need to do the whole patch bay and then you need to do a sound check. And then and then you need to do the first two, three takes just to, to see if the groove is right. And then maybe you track the song and then you need to edit that song and then mix it. I mean, it's so long, but you need to love it, you know? And nowadays we've... We always work in a rush. We all have deadlines. They are necessary, you know, because it's it's nice to have something to stick to. Okay, on the 20th of that month, the song is ready and that's it. But allow yourself in the meanwhile to spend a lot of time with that song if needed. And you need to like it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so if if you find yourself writing a song... Maybe it's your song, someone else's, mm -hmm. and you're stuck. Mm -hmm. What have you found is the best way to get out of that being stuck? Um, it, it really depends on, I guess, the people and the song. What works for me is to let go of the song sometimes. If the song is not happening more, it means that the, the appointment is over. That's it. I had a meeting with creativity. Oh, she's gone. Okay. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> you know? Um, so nowadays I just let go. I have a good idea. It starts. I feel like it has potential. It's not carrying on. Okay, fine. It's, it's going to be a draft forever, probably. Or I can also pair it up with another song. So for example, that chorus could go with the verse of that song if I either play it in the same key or if it's already in the same key. So I start puzzling ideas because whether you created a song today or yesterday, it's still coming from you. It's your creativity. You know, it's like a painter with the same colors. So whether you are painting today or tomorrow, it's the same palette. It's the same flavors. So there is a possibility that the verse of today could go with the chorus of yesterday and maybe the bridge of a month ago on, of another project. So sometimes puzzling your ideas can actually work. Or I listen to music. You know, if I, if I feel like, okay, inspiration is there. I want to do something. I've got something to sublime with my hands, but it's not happening. I listen to music, mm. you know. 
I just go back or just go further. Yeah, maybe I listen to very modern music and, I, and I'm like, okay, I want to match that. I want to do this. And then I go back to my synth or guitar, whatever I have that day. And uh, yeah, I got a few new things, you yeah. know, to uh, that I learned and that I could reproduce and change. There is that um, motto that a wonderful teacher at BIM told me. He was He's called Graham Godfrey. He's an amazing drummer. And uh, he once talked in class about imitate, assimilate, and innovate. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, this is still what I do every day. Every day, I get a new information about a song, a, a producing technique, a guitar lick, anything. I, I take it, I learn it, I start owning it, and then I create something new with it. And... You, you can do that when you write a song, you mm. know, learn, learn the songs of others. You know, they're there for a reason. They're there to make you enjoy them, but also you can play them. You know, when, when you play an instrument, you are incredibly lucky. You suddenly have the possibility of learning every piece of music around, yeah, exactly. you know, and even when you play guitar, you can learn percussions with your guitar if you want, you know, mm -hmm. you can reproduce so many things with your, with your right hand. So embrace that. You know, mm -hmm. embrace that, learn things, imitate them, and then take them in your playing if it's needed, you know, yeah. and take your instrument and your and your creativity further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was something I actually talked about yesterday on another episode with another guy uh, about Beatles. Yeah. Because I was like, I was asking him, how come, or the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd, I guess, all those old bands nowadays, they was all so young. But they, they made tremendous songs. And his his response was like, well, Beatles, for example, mm -hmm. they obviously played in Hamburg for quite a long period before they became the Beatles, right? It's like exactly. you said, they learned shitloads of songs. Yes. They internalized them and I guess made them their own when they became the Beatles. And the gigs at the time were five to eight hours long. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. it was not the gigs we do today with our 45 minute <laughs> yeah. set, you know, yeah. they were constantly, constantly playing. Yeah. So yeah, it just goes to show that that method is important. It's important to learn very, songs, you know, and never, never to lose it, I guess. Exactly. Mm. And that's why I really respect every kind of musician, even the people who feel like they do, they were not born to create and they were born to simply replicate music or have a function band or be or teach music or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, like you are, whatever you do, you are doing something for music. Even when you replicate it, you are, you are inspiring other people. Yeah, you, exactly. you are showing it to people who probably didn't know it and they're going to get to want to know more and maybe learn the instrument you played that day you know so um so that's the thing playing playing other people's songs yeah is essential for your vocabulary mm -hmm. you know you can't only focus on your own stuff no, that's exactly. very cocky yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true man yeah, it's fascinating yes um but let's talk about your band indigo face yes um i mean so first of all you guys met at BIM. Yes, we did. We were on the same year, the same promotion. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we started. Uh, it was um, Andrea, Ray, Maria Chiara and I. And uh, we, we all met during the live performance workshops at school. So basically every week we were performing a new song. And um, oh, because you're all in different departments. Exactly. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I was studying guitar. Ray was studying bass, Andrea was studying drum, and Mary was studying vocals. And we were meeting every Wednesday of every week, learning a new song. And the teachers were basically designing the bands. Mm -hmm. So they were saying, you, you're going to play with her, and you're going to play with that drummer and that guitar player. And we all met like that, basically, doing rounds sometimes together, I remember enjoying playing with Mary and then enjoying playing with Ray and whether Andrea was on drums or not. And then so quite quickly, we just uh, remembered each other and, and we were like, I think I think the four of us, there's something clicking, you know, maybe yeah. we should uh, we should hang out and jam or do something. And um, yeah, it, it started there. It it started um, 
Indigo Face started with Mary and I. Right. Um, so Maria Cara is Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, she, she was looking for a producer and arranger at the time. She had a song called Glimmer. And uh, that we never released, by the way. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, it was a very, very sweet song. And uh, and she contacted me and said, uh, listen, I'm looking for someone to take that song further, to record it and, and probably some guitar on it, you know. And I was like, uh, yep, I can do it. So um, so we met and, uh, and it just clicked straight away. You right. know, we were... Um, we were just made to make music together. You know, I just enjoyed everything. And it was one of the first times after arriving in London that I was creating again properly, you know, um, and applying my 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 knowledge of guitar for someone else's song. Mm-hmm. I was writing my songs at the time. I had my project. But working with Mary was, was something new for me, you know. Right. And... Um, and then Ray and Andrea were our backup band mm-hmm. uh, at the time, so we were performing Mary's song under her name, and uh, and then Mary and I became a duo and then a band. Right. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. But so, because you've been playing how many years? Five. Six? Um. Well, we've been playing together for eight years. Right. But we've been a band for nearly five years. Right. Yes. And how is it? Because obviously everyone knows the music industry has changed, blah, 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 et cetera. So how is it? How is it having a band, you know, in London now? It doesn't matter, it's London, but just trying to run a band and make a living doing it or getting onto Spotify playlists or record your stuff. How, how, how is that 2019? <laughs> it's wonderful and hard at the same time right and sometimes it's even wonderfully hard you Mm. know it's just uh again you need you need to love the journey and you need to have patience you know some bands take off straight away Mm -hmm. some other bands may need more eps more rehearsing more touring more visuals you know um we are a band that changed um Along the years, you know, so uh, we went from having a sound that was very acoustic to a sound that was more electro. And now we're moving to a very straightforward pop sound, you know. So we are a band that that is that we're constantly tweaking, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, and we're enjoying that at the moment. And people are enjoying us on that journey. You know, we did amazing gigs on that journey amazing festivals and we had successful songs uh on spotify and and so that's the thing it's we still feel like we're at the start you know because we want bigger things Mm -hmm. but when we look back we're like whoa we've done a lot you know like a year ago i wouldn't have thought i would have done that gig Mm -hmm. or would have done a song that sounds like that or would have had that article in that magazine or whatever you know, so, um, but yes, it's hard, you know, we are a lot. And uh, I was saying at the beginning that London is that family of musicians. When you start having your own band, that family becomes a bit more complex. It's right. a grown up family, you know, it's these cousins that are a bit dodgy and you don't know if you should hang out with them or not you know the other bands are friends but also competitors Mm -hmm. you know but still we are we are very lucky to be surrounded by very talented artists very talented bands and we're supporting each other you know um indigo face has played with uh with other bands and we're, we're writing with other bands that are sometimes bigger than us and we don't feel like there's a condescendent attitude from any of these bands. And some, some smaller artists also want to work with us because we're bigger than them. It's just a, it's a whole system that you need to enjoy. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess what has changed is that um, a few years ago, it was still the, 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 the making it was being signed. Right. At the time, you know, you needed a label, mm-hmm. you needed a contract, you you needed your advance money to be like, yep, that's it. I fucking made it. I can retire now. You know, yeah. nowadays it's completely different. You know, even even labels are 
changing their strategies. You know, they're they're not even investing so much money on the artist. They're they're asking the artist to provide most of the money for videos or, or PRs. Or, so the whole thing is changing completely. And, and you have these new structures online that are now kind of virtual labels like AWOL, for example, you mm. know. So um, being signed now is so blurry, you know. Yeah. And um, the thing that is happening now is that a lot of bands are signed, but parked among other bands that sound like them and only one of them makes it mm. you know um bands have become kind of a supermarket and the labels are like okay we're gonna sign this guy that band that artist that female artist and they're all doing similar pop music for example and only one of them is going to get the golden ticket to right. the big stage right, right. you know yeah. and all the others are going to have their contract given back to them and right. And I've seen enough people around me being in that situation, you know, parked by a, by a label and then refused. These people have been literally traumatized by by their label experience. So it changed my focus mm -hmm. um, with creating music and also producing music. You know, I have more fun producing quirky independent artists than sometimes obvious signed artists because they have less... They have less limits, you know. I like when artists go bonkers in the studio, you know. Just don't obey anything. Just try everything. That's more fun to me, mm -hmm. you know. And also doing pop music in an independent way nowadays is, okay, it's much wilder. It's much more expensive because you need to provide a lot of the money yourself. Right. But you meet so many more people, you know, and... You go, you do your gigs yourself, you know, you carry your own gear, you meet the promoter, you get paid by the promoter, you you email that that guy back after the gig, you look for a manager yourself. You get a better picture, I guess, of how, how the mess is humanly, you know. Um, I guess bands that are taken care of at an early stage don't get the same approach, you know. For them, it's straightforward, something that is automated, being right. famous in music. Mm -hmm. um, whether we make it or not, I'm loving the journey, yeah. you know, with Indigo Face. I think we're creating very cool songs. I mm. love what we do together. I love our gigs. I love the people we meet. I love when we fail because I know that the next step is going to be better. Yeah, exactly. You know, I look forward to everything. Mm. And just for that... I, I just I just enjoy every thrill of it, you know, yeah. every minute of it. Yeah, yeah, totally, mm. man. So something that I think is interesting, interesting for many artists is how do you get on a Spotify playlist? Is there a golden secret thing you do? Corruption, <laughs> man, you know? Yeah. yeah. Save <laughs> loads of cash, meet the right people under the bridge. And, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Now, to be honest, I'm, I'm not a specialist about that. Right. Um, in the band, it's Mary and Andrea right. that are doing all the very geeky admin stuff. I'm right. more behind the music side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's basically about um, this form that um, Spotify provides, and you need to fill it up in a very, very accurate way. So it's basically, and this is actually interesting creatively talking because they're asking you to describe your songs with words that are not musical at all. As you know, like playlists, what? for example, playlists are, are tailored for cooking, having sex, walking your dog, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like doing anything, you know, DIY or uh, ironing, like whatever. But it's actually true that Playlists are tailored for activities that are not musical. Yeah. So your song needs to respond to someone's activity that is not always linked to music. Yeah, it's weird, man. That has definitely, that's something that's definitely changed. Yes, of course. Because it used to be music is an activity. Exactly. But you now, were sitting yeah, in listening. front of your speakers looking at the booklet mm -hmm. and you were enjoying the album or the cassette. Yeah. It's not like that anymore. No. That's crazy. You're doing other things with music. Yeah. Now, so as know? a musician these days, that's something you have to think about. Of course. Yeah. Drastically. I'm, I'm a pop producer. And when I produce a pop song, I know that the first 30 seconds of the track are the ones, you know, you need to get the listener there. If, if you don't get the listener in these first 30 seconds, in these first 
30 seconds, you know that that person is going to move to the next song. Yeah. So, and that's because people are doing something else or they're texting while they're listening to the song. So if you want to make them stop their activity and say, wait a minute, what is that? This is a cool track. You need to have the hook, the right lyric, the right melody, the right boomy kick, you know, something that just entertains people, you know, the, the killer riff, you know. Something. How did you do that in 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that, that's why people hire you. <laughs> uh, I mean, me personally, I don't know. I don't have a recipe. You know, it just depends on the song. It just depends on the artist. Um, I look back, you know, when, when I want that to happen, I look back and I, I check the songs of the same month or same year that are being released and I ask myself, why is that successful? Why are the cool kids listening to that? What is the thing, you know? And there's always a reason. There's that, there's that texture, there's that plucky synth, there's that riff um, or that reverse effect, something that is just concerning, appealing for attention, you know? And I pay attention to that. And if it's about a pop rock record or a rock record, I look back in, in, into riffs, you know, and guitar riffs are actually the very first hooks, you know, they are the, the first um, hint of pop music, you know, the, it was starting with the guitar and then the song was starting. So when you listen to Money for Nothing or Johnny Be Good or Pepperback Writer, these are notes on the guitar that suddenly become symbols just or, or satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, you know, mm -hmm. they were the first hooks in pop music. Right. And they were announcing what the next 30 seconds were, you know? Right. And people, when people sing these songs, they often sing the riff, you know, that's what you remember. Yeah. Then there's a whole melody, there's a whole context and everything, but it's all about the riff. And, and uh, a pop track is the same, whether you're playing guitar or not. You need that element that is just calling the identity of the track, you know, and giving it its flavor and its special thing. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool, man. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Michael Jackson, for example, when you look at his songs, well, when you listen to his songs, um, there's not a lot of guitar on, on, on them, like, let's say, prominent guitars, okay? Like, the guitars are everywhere, but they're mostly funky or Slash played a few solos and everything, but they're not guitar riff based songs. But Quincy Jones, when he produced the albums, had that in mind and they created together keyboards riff that are just symbols or, or even drum hooks. You know, you know, when you listen to the first two beats of Billie Jean, mm. that it's Billie Jean. Yeah, 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 It's that pocket. It's that sound that is just telling you, you that, that is just asking you to listen to the next 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, you, suddenly you are like, oh, whoa, this is tight. This is great. What's next? Yeah. You know, and Smooth Criminal is one of the most incredible keyboards riff ever, you know. So, um yeah, it's not just about the guitar. It's, it's about that melodic information that you want to attract people with. Yeah. But so how do you think, because nowadays so many songs sound the same, right? Yes. And how do you think you're able to, able, able to stand out today? I mean, is it easier because so much sound the same, so it's easier to sound different? Or do you still have to try to adhere to this formula that exists? I think it's harder to sound different mm. nowadays. Um, I think the guilty element is the computer, definitely. Right. Um, digital audio workstations and plugins have created um, a sort of uniform kind of sound that pop music has nowadays. And when you think of it, the plugin, even when you paid $150, that's still cheap it's nothing and every every producer can afford a good plugin mm -hmm. so the thing is that we're all getting the same tools at some point whether you are in ukraine in south africa in france in uk in la we are all using the same plugins mm -hmm. so we're all using the same presets sometimes you're using the same colors and this has created a lot of uh, similarities between worldwide pop music i mean it is good and bad you know i enjoy pop music um, 
I enjoy pop music everywhere, you know. Um, but it's true that it's got more of a more um, monotonous sound. Mm. And we are very conscious of that with Indigo Face, for mm. example. And we try to get out of our comfortable territory and try to go somewhere else, mm. you know. This is why I, I am a pop producer. I love pop music, but... I'm and I'm saying it with no shame. I'm I'm not listening to pop music every day as my go-to music. You know, I get inspired by all the things. World music inspires me. Singer-songwriters inspire me. Classical music, you know, uh, Caribbean music, percussions. These are the things that are feeding my vocabulary for pop music because I know also that they are things that I can access only myself almost i have my little taste my little things that i like that probably the producer next door doesn't have mm. so i can translate these influences and create something that is hopefully a bit different not better but simply different that right. tastes l like something else and hopefully i can innovate with that mm -hmm. you know yeah i mean indigo face definitely has another sound than your standard whoever Katy yeah. Perry, you know, <laughs> which is cool, man. Uh, so that's something you guys definitely has managed to do. Yeah. So that's nice. <laughs> um, let's talk about Indigo Face again, because you you won this competition. I don't remember the name of the competition. 1M Europe. Yeah. And you got to play at the festival in Italy. Yeah. What was the name of that festival again? The Primo Maggio. That was it. Yeah. Because I remember, obviously, I wasn't there seeing you guys play, mm. but I met you when you won the competition here in London, yes. saw you guys playing in the restaurant downstairs. Yes. And there was something like glowing about you guys, the four of you. Uh, you know, you can see it. That's just me looking at you guys jamming uh, mm. downstairs. There was something, you can touch it, you know, some magic with you guys. So how was that experience oh, being man. able to do the whole thing? We were, we were on a cloud, really. I mean... Um, um, I'm the only non-Italian of the band. Uh, mm. So now it's me, Mary and Andrea in the band. And um, so I didn't really understand what was the meaning of this Primo Maggio festival. <laughs> but it's basically the Italian Glastonbury. You know, it's massive to play on that stage. And I just didn't get it. And it's in Rome, right? It's in Rome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, it was this competition. I think it was run among 300 bands in Europe. And um, yeah, we we won it. And it was a few gigs, you know, so you got in semi-final and final. And, and um, it was amazing, really good competitors, really good other bands. Um, but yeah, we won. And yeah. um, and we, we suddenly flew to Italy a week after. We played this single of ours called The Seed. And it was the fastest gig ever we just played one single on that stage in rome so it was literally three minutes 50 performance in front of sixty-five thousand people and then we had to get in our car again and drive to the south of italy in a city called matera and we did there what is still nowadays the best gig i've ever done mm. really it was very emotional we played in front of four five thousand people it was hard to say but quite a lot of people and uh, although it was way less than Rome, but we were guest of honor in, in this city, which is a beautiful old town of the south of Italy. And um, I remember we did an hour set and most of the people in the, in the first rows were singing our songs. Wow. And uh, we didn't know them. And I thought they didn't know us, but they actually <laughs> checked us out and learned a few choruses, you know. And it was just very emotional to be this young indie band from London suddenly arriving in that city for an hour set and seeing these people that don't even that I don't even speak the language of mm -hmm. singing my songs, yeah. you know, our songs. It was just it was very very emotional. We we dropped a few tears, you know, on, yeah, on stage yeah. playing these songs. It was just beautiful, mm. really beautiful. Uh, a very fast experience and it was just one day yeah and um and then we flew the day after back to london and we suddenly had 
all these new fans in Italy craving for new music to know us more. And uh, and we're still entertaining some of these fans nowadays with our music, you yeah. know. So, uh, yeah, it was a great, great experience. Yeah, it's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, you can really tell, you know. It was it was cool to witness from a distance. So. Yeah. We suddenly saw people learning the bass parts of that song or the guitar parts, and it was like, whoa. Yeah. I have influence on people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> You know, yeah, that, that must be some. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must be some kind of dream having other people. Yeah, playing your your songs. I guess it's it's very sweet. Yeah, you know, and it reminded me of that very first gig I told you about at, at that circus when I was a fashion student. Mm -hmm. Just seeing people enjoying your music, listening to you, meeting you after the show. You know, that was at at eighteen. It was already my very first experience, and I lived I lived it the exact same way. You mm. know. Although it was with my own band and mm -hmm. it was bigger, you know, but I felt the same, the same passion, the same new feeling of it. Yeah. You know, it's just beautiful. Yeah. Music is, is sharing. Yeah. You know, if you're a bedroom player, good for you. But when you start performing in front of people, when you see the smile, the emotion of people and then hear the clapping, there's, there's nothing like it. No. It's the best emotion ever. You're flying. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So either if it's a few thousand or sixty thousand, you or still feel like you can even ten people, man. I'll yeah. be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know? you still feel like that's <clears throat> where you belong. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're not afraid to. I need a bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the stage, and when I get too much of it, I miss the studio. Right. You know, because the studio is where I have all my toys. It's my bedroom. Yeah. You know, and that's where I can be, that naive child looking for new informations, playing, dismantling things, trying new things. You can't really do that on stage. No. Stage is about applying, you know, and reproducing the same show day after day. So it can be quite consuming, you know. The studio, there is that constant sparkle about every day. Every day is different. Mm. You're never doing the same thing. It's never the same show, you know. Mm. Um, so I, I really need both. You know, mm. I feel myself in the studio i really have fun and when i have too much of it i'm like okay now it's time to go on stage and have a few gigs you know yeah. so hopefully i can keep that balance all my life and, yeah, yeah 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 exactly man okay so before we wrap up where can people find more info about you your band do you have a web page for a studio for example yes so i have a web page for the studio it's www.popomstudio.com P-O-P-O-M studio.com. We'll leave a link below in the comments. Click it. And then, um, of course, we have a, a web page for Indigo Face. It's www.indigofacemusic.com. And you can follow us on every platform, iTunes, Spotify, you know, everywhere. Cool, man. Mm. Well, thanks for coming out to the podcast. Thank you very much. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Maxime, for com coming on to the podcast. It was awesome talking to you. Uh, and hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Before you leave, uh, I would love for you to leave a rating and a comment on Apple Podcasts or YouTube or Spotify. Maybe they don't do comments, but yeah, all the other platforms, platforms uh, leave a rating. Uh, it would help to spread the word. Um, and before you leave, don't for forget to check out the free guide in the description below. Three tested ways to increase your client base. Download it, learn from it, use the script, and get more clients and all those sort of awesome stuff. Uh, and I see you guys next week. <laughs>